Cheryl Shepard was born on September 29, 1968. In 1997, at the age of 29, Cheryl lived in an apartment on Queenston Road with her boyfriend, Michael Lavoie, and her mom, Odette Fisher, and worked at Tim Hortons after previously working as an exotic dancer. On December 31, 1997, she and Michael attended a New Year's Eve party at the Hamilton Convention Center that was broadcast on live TV in Hamilton, Ontario. That night on live TV, Michael proposed to Cheryl, and she said yes. Hamilton, apparently Mike has a very, very important question to ask this young lady, or this young lady. All righty. Come on in Mike. here. All right, go ahead. This young lady, right here. In 1998, I'd like to ask you to marry me, Cheryl. There's the proposal. After the party, she notified friends and family who were shocked about the engagement due to their tumultuous relationship. Michael was known for his horrible temper, which caused Cheryl to stay with friends on numerous occasions. He was also very possessive and physically abusive, and Cheryl was often seen covered in bruises. A mutual friend of the couple even saw him grab her by the throat and scream, If you keep effing around with me, something's going to happen to you. His possessiveness was so bad that he would sit in Tim Hortons for an entire eight hours of her shift. He did this to make sure she wasn't flirting with other men. Her boss became frustrated by the situation and finally asked him to leave. Almost immediately after the engagement, Cheryl changed her mind and told friends she planned to call it off or maybe she never intended to marry him and only said yes due to the pressure of live TV. Regardless, she feared how Michael would react and said, don't be surprised if I go missing. Sadly, that's exactly what happened. Cheryl's mother last spoke to her on January 1st, not knowing this would be the last time she would ever talk to her daughter again. Two days later, Odette returned from New Brunswick, where she had been visiting relatives and waited on Cheryl to pick her up as planned, but she never arrived. When she finally got home, Michael told her he hadn't seen Cheryl in a couple of days. As the days passed and there was still no sign of her, Odette reported her missing. Michael claimed that on the evening of January 2, 1998, he dropped Cheryl off in the alley of the Concord Hotel in Niagara Falls, Ontario at 6.30 p.m., where she allegedly had a gig as an exotic dancer. However, no one reported seeing Cheryl or anyone matching her description, and the manager of the hotel told detectives he had never met or hired Cheryl. Her family also found this strange and insisted that she would have never gone back to exotic dancing. The maintenance man and a neighbor of Michael's claimed they saw him with two large plastic bags in the parking garage the weekend Cheryl disappeared. Investigators searched her apartment and found blood in the hallway and on her bedroom door. They also found that her bed sheets were missing, the pitcher along with the glass was missing from the pitcher frame above the bed, and broken glass was found in a box on the balcony. Her clothes were still in her closet, and her wallet, glasses, and contacts remained in the apartment. This next part is really strange. When Odette returned home, she noticed the curtain rod in the living room was missing, and the curtains had been nailed to the wall. After she was reported missing, Michael never participated in the search and refused to cooperate with the investigation. What he did instead was pack up his clothes and leave the apartment. Authorities then found him unconscious in Cheryl's white Buick inside a storage unit, attempting to take his own life by carbon monoxide poisoning. He was then named the prime suspect in the case, but has never been charged. Interestingly, Cheryl had allegedly given an audio tape and a letter to her sister and told her if anything ever happened to her to give the items to the police. Also, two separate sources revealed that Michael had been blackmailing Cheryl with the compromising videotape. Sorry y'all, if this is true, I have no clue what would be on the tape. Michael has not spoken to police for years, but an ex of his told investigators that he once broke both her cheekbones during an argument and told her he often fantasized about killing her. Right after Cheryl disappeared, Michael immediately moved in and began dating Sheila Darbyson. Sheila told detectives that Michael was extremely paranoid and at times thought his car was bugged. 
She also said that when he first showed up around the time Cheryl went missing, she noticed a fresh bite mark on his left arm and scratches on his back and told her Cheryl had attacked him. Unfortunately, she didn't inform the police at the time and they were never able to photograph the marks. Sadly, as of September 2023, Cheryl has never been found and this case remains unsolved. Melanie Nadia Ethier was born on December 25, 1980, and went by mail. At the age of 15, she, her younger sister Jesse, and their mom Celine lived in New Lascaird, Ontario. Mel's father was from Botswana and at some point returned to Africa and was uninvolved in her life. As a young teen, Mel was an honors student and was described as bubbly with a lovely personality. She worked at a local daycare and wanted to become a teacher after graduating from high school. Unfortunately, Mel's family was having financial difficulties with their car breaking down and their phone service being cut off. All this really affected Mel emotionally. On Saturday morning, September 28, 1996, Mel visited her mother's friend Sylvie Chartrand's home. Afterward, she headed downtown and ran into her best friend at a bus stop outside the public library. The girls then decided to have lunch at a place called Pizza Pizza. It was there that she told her friend her idea of becoming a teacher and how she wanted to volunteer in her father's home country of Botswana. After the pizza place, Mel went shopping and purchased some candles, frosting, candy hearts, and a new cake pan to make a cake for her grandmother's birthday party the next day. She then stopped by a house to collect money she earned from one of her babysitting jobs. She then met up with her new boyfriend, Neil Fortier, and some of his friends, Dave Bromley, Jay Denomi, and Ryan Chatwin. At about 9 p.m., the group of teens went to a video rental store and rented the movie Sudden Death. Not long after, the group arrived at Mel's home to watch the movie, but Celine told her that her room was too dirty to have guests come over. So the teens left and attempted to watch the movie at Dave's girlfriend, Samia Benchaby's home. However, they were turned away because her family was preparing for a move and Samia joined them briefly as they walked to another house. Samia then left the group when they reached the Armstrong Street Bridge, saying that it had gotten too cold out and returned home. Shortly after 10 p.m., Dave also decided to return home, and the group ended up at Ryan Chatwin's home on Pine Avenue. His house was six blocks away, which was about a 10 to 12 minute walk from Mel's home. The remaining teens watched the movie quietly in the basement while Ryan's parents were asleep upstairs. Before 1 a.m., while the movie was still playing, Jay left and went home. Mel's female friend also left early and headed to Mel's home, where Mel's grandparents had planned to give her a ride home to Haleyberry. At this point, all that was left was Mel, her boyfriend Neil, and Ryan. On her way to Mel's home, her friend encountered a suspicious vehicle, a white or light-colored two-door Chevrolet Monte Carlo in poor condition with a gray patch on the right side. The car slowly approached her as she crossed through an intersection. She was so unnerved by the incident that she ran to the next intersection by the Armstrong Street Bridge, which was better lit. She followed the same route Mel would soon be taken home and thankfully eventually made it to Mel's house. Later on, Neil escorted Mel to the door and watched her walk west down Pine Avenue East. After that, she was never seen again. Her female friend believes there were two teenagers in the car that stalked her, but after that night, she never saw the car again. Mel's route would have taken her through three intersections, over the Armstrong Street Bridge, past a gas station and apartment building, up a back alley or along a main road, and finally to the top of Church Street, where her home was located. The gas station had surveillance, but never showed Mel walking by. According to family and friends, Mel typically used the back alley when making this journey. The bridge was the only portion of her route that was brightly lit, and the street would have been reasonably busy even at the late hour when she was seen crossing it. After the bridge, the last stretch of her walk home involved a poorly lit back road where the video rental store she had visited earlier in the day was located. 
Celine became aware of her daughter's absence the next morning when Mel's alarm clock was going off and she discovered her daughter was not in her bedroom. As it was not uncharacteristic of Mel to spend the night at her friend's house, Celine didn't think much of it and went back to bed, waking back up after 8 a.m. At 10 o'clock, her grandparents arrived at the house to celebrate her grandmother's birthday. Mel was supposed to be baking a cake for the party, but she was nowhere to be found. So Celine and her father drove to a nearby Tim Hortons to purchase a cake and call around in hopes of finding Mel. That's when she learned that Mel had left Ryan's house in the middle of the night to head home. When Mel didn't arrive at her daycare job as scheduled, her family reported her missing. More than a dozen officers and volunteer firefighters began canvassing the areas where Mel had last been sighted, and police forces across Ontario were alerted to her disappearance. All of the friends who were with Mel on the night of her disappearance were questioned and all provided the same story. However, this wouldn't stop years of rumors with people believing they were involved. Officers interrogated hundreds of suspects and persons of interest throughout their investigation. The police conducted another search for Mel on April 26, 1999, focusing on the Dawson Point area to the east of New Lisgeard, which had previously not been investigated. In the summer of 2000, police seized materials from the landfill in McGarry as part of the investigation. However, like a lot of findings in this case, police would not share them publicly. An eyewitness described that she and her husband were driving across the bridge when both spotted a teenage girl walking south on the eastern sidewalk. The night was clear and they saw no vehicles or other pedestrians on the bridge. However, they didn't report their account to the police until 1998 when they saw Mel's photo. A second witness came forward years later to state they had seen Mel on the Armstrong Street Bridge that night. According to the witness, she spotted a girl near the midway point of the bridge around 1.45 a.m. From the backseat view of her friend's car, the witness saw the girl walking on the bridge's western sidewalk when a car pulled over and two young men exited the vehicle. The boys then proceeded to corner the girl and coerce her into entering their car before speeding off. The witness recalled the car being a small blue or light-colored sedan but could not remember what the girl she saw looked like. The detective on the case has expressed doubt about the authenticity of this version of events and has stated that media reports about similar sightings had caused numerous non-credible tips from people who alleged they saw an abduction on the bridge that night. Another witness who had lived on Rebecca Street, just off Pine Avenue and near Docks, took her story to the police in 2019. This witness claimed that at around 1.45 a.m. on September 29, 1996, she was doing schoolwork in her room when she heard a girl screaming outside. Although initially ignored the outburst, she heard more screaming about 45 seconds later and became frightened. After checking that her front door was locked, she looked out of her window and saw three silhouettes of people running down the street towards Pine Avenue, but saw no vehicles or headlights. In 2021, police received a tip from an anonymous male witness who heard about the case on a podcast called The Next Call. This tip led police to LaRoque Field in North Cobalt, a few miles from Mel's last known location, where they spent three days searching. However, if any evidence was found, it was not made public. A friend of the Ethier family, Dennis Euclid Leveille, had remained a primary suspect in the case. Leveille was in a long-term relationship with Sylvie Chartrand, and they remained in a relationship for 37 years until he died in 2016. Interestingly, a homemade headstone was found in a North Cobalt Cemetery that read, Rest in Peace, Melanie Ethier. And guess who used to work there? Dennis Leveille. He was also very familiar with the area. The day after Mel was reported missing, her grandmother had a strange encounter with Leveille. For some reason, he came into their basement to smoke a cigarette, which he had never done before. Also, Celine didn't even allow smoking in her home. Three days into the investigation, Leveille commented to the grandmother that the person who had harmed her daughter would have had to be very strong as she was capable of defending herself, and to prove his point, Leveille showed the grandmother deep nail marks on his arms, which he said Mel had made while they were play fighting. 
At this point, Celine became very suspicious of him. He then claimed that he went out of town on the Friday before Mel disappeared and only returned after she was reported missing. However, when pressed, Leveille told Celine he had seen Mel working as a stripper in nearby Notre Dame de Nord, though this was later found to have been a woman who resembled Mel. In the years following these interactions, Celine distanced her family from Leveille over her suspicions. On two occasions, he called Celine from a hotel room, threatening to take his own life. On both occasions, she helped Leveille, believing he might confess to harming her daughter, but he never did. Other people who knew Leveille also voiced their suspicions about the scratches on his arm extending from his wrist to his elbow. Sylvie recalled him showing her the marks on the afternoon after Mel disappeared, saying she had made them while they were play fighting, though she could not understand when they would have seen each other as the marks looked fresh. Later that day, Leveille told his neighbor, Joycelyn Martel, that the marks were caused by him brushing up against branches while looking for Mel in the woods. Neither of Leveille's children believes they ever witnessed him play fight with Mel. Also, he had a long history of making sexual advances against minors. Lionel Martel, Leveille's best friend, said that while Leveille was under the influence of drugs, he would mention Mel and another girl, saying, they'll never find them. Leveille also spent several months in prison for drugging and sexually abusing one of Martel's nieces. In a 2021 interview, Leveille's daughter, Stephanie, stated that six of her friends had come forward to describe Leveille sexually harassing or assaulting them. On one occasion around 2000, Leveille followed one of his daughter's friends into the sunroom of his house and told the girl he would like to make her experience an orgasm. Leveille had a falling out with his brothers around this time, with at least one of them making it clear he was no longer allowed to be around his niece. Years later, Leveille was briefly jailed for sexually assaulting one of his daughter's friends in the family home as his daughter and partner were asleep, but he was later acquitted. In 2014, he was sentenced to serve time in prison after pleading guilty to a similar offense and was released after several months. Around 10 years after Mel disappeared, Leveille lured her younger sister, Jessie, to a hotel under the premise that she was going to a babysitting job. Once inside the hotel room, he began doing drugs while stripping naked. He then started making sexual comments towards Jessie. She had plans to meet her boyfriend at around 2.45 that day and finally convinced Leveille to let her leave. After that, she completely cut ties with him and the Chartran family. This also convinced her he was involved in her sister's disappearance. Leveille had been charged with criminal offenses at least three times. One was in 2006 when he failed to comply with orders not to associate or communicate with several people. Another in 2012 for making death threats, committing assault with a vehicle, possessing an illegal taser, and violating the terms of his parole. Then in 2013, for sexual interference with someone under the age of 16. While in prison, Leveille was visited by Celine, who directly asked about his involvement in her daughter's case, but he said he could never hurt Mel and suggested someone else had murdered her instead. In 2016, after his release, Celine once again tried to make contact with him. However, the evening they were supposed to speak, he suffered a debilitating stroke, paralyzing him down one side of his body and limiting his ability to speak. A few hours earlier, he confessed to his daughter, Stephanie, that he lied about his alibi the weekend Mel disappeared. He claimed he went to a motocross competition, but there was no evidence of that. Two weeks later, on January 8, 2016, Leveille died while still in the hospital. While hospitalized after his stroke, he was approached by a private investigator who attempted to question him about the disappearance. When the detective left, Leveille used his non-paralyzed hand to grab his daughter's scarf and pull on it tightly until she offered to tell investigators to leave him alone. In June 2021, two friends of Leveille came forward to say he had driven to their house while under the influence in 2013 or 2014 and confessed to killing Mel, though he refused to say what he did with her body and later threatened to harm them if they ever shared what he'd told them. 
Celine has alleged that her daughter's body may be buried on one of LaVeille's friend's property, which they purchased in May 1996 and allowed him to access freely for many years. Celine maintains that she considers LaVeille the prime suspect in her daughter's disappearance and does not believe the police made an appropriate effort to investigate him while he was alive. Investigators unfortunately didn't question any of the Chartran family when Mel originally disappeared. There are multiple other theories in the case, ranging from Mel being hit by a drunk driver and that she was mistaken for someone else, but these theories have never been proven. The boys she was with the night she disappeared were suspects for a while, and rumors about their involvement continued for years. While the police treated them harshly at the time, they have since been ruled out as suspects. Celine Ethier created a Facebook page titled, Let's Work Together to Find Melanie Ethier. Sadly, as of September 2023, Mel has never been found, and this case remains unsolved. Kevin Wesley Martin was born on July 23, 1980. In 1994, at the age of 13, Kevin lived in the small town of Stellarton, Nova Scotia on McKay Street, just a short walk from Ford Street and the nearby high school. He lived with his mother, Bonnie, and stepfather, Danny, and multiple siblings. Kevin was described as a soft-hearted, quiet boy who was kind to his younger siblings. Sadly, in 1987, Kevin's brother, Olin, died in a house fire. The two were only 10 months apart and shared a room together. They were extremely close and even looked very similar. A year later, Bonnie and Danny married. Kevin took Olin's death hard and was never the same after that. By 1994, Kevin had become a rebellious teenager who would run away from home at times. He was even being bullied at school. He longed to make friends, but in his desperation, he ended up in a group of less than savory kids who were known for skipping school. On May 19, 1994, an extremely agitated Kevin ran away from home and went to stay with a friend in nearby Thorburn. Bonnie and Danny drove out to Thorburn, picked him up, and brought him home. Once they arrived at their house, Kevin exited the car, jumped the fence, and ran off. His mother called for him to return home, but he ignored her. Since this was typical behavior, they didn't chase after him and instead called the police. Plus, Danny had a cast on his broken leg, making it impossible to go after him. The police assumed Kevin would return in a day or two and didn't initially look into his disappearance. But the days went on and Kevin never returned home. The police had received tips from friends and family, claiming to have seen Kevin or spoken to him in the area. They also received tips from strangers who reported that Kevin was headed out west. Kevin's grandma began driving around the Stellarton streets with police officer Hugh Muir, hoping to catch a glimpse of him, but she never did. By the winter of 1994, police were checking local camps in the nearby woods, believing he may have decided to camp out for a while. However, they never found any sign of him. At this point, the police began to suspect that something had happened to him and he was possibly dead. On November 13, 2000, loggers working in the Burnside area of rural Colchester County discovered a sneaker sticking out of the dirt. Upon further inspection, they found human remains in a shallow grave near Upper Stuyaki, about 25 miles from his home. Investigators determined the remains belonged to Kevin and ruled his death a homicide. They believe he was murdered shortly after he disappeared. Very little information has been released regarding his cause of death, but they did say his death was violent. Four months later, in March 2001, his family was notified of the discovery. Not long after the remains were identified, Bonnie revealed that Danny was a person of interest in the case. However, she doesn't believe her husband was involved, and with the cast on his leg, it would have been very difficult for him even to chase Kevin. It's believed that more than one person was involved in Kevin's death. At one point, Bonnie received information from a woman named Debbie, who told her about three people who had allegedly killed Kevin. Debbie spoke with reporters and said that she learned the details of the murder from a relative of hers. She also gave the information to the police. 
Many locals suspect that the three individuals are teenagers that Kevin had been hanging out with in the months leading up to his death. It's believed they lured him out to the logging road and murdered him. Those teenagers were most likely older than Kevin because the only way to get to that area was to drive. However, that's never been proven due to the lack of evidence, and those individuals have never been charged. Unfortunately, it's now been over 30 years, and we still don't have answers, and this case remains unsolved. What is that called? It's a boogie. A boogie. Michael Wayne Donahue was born on May 12, 1986, and lived with his parents in Victoria, British Columbia, Canada. On Sunday, March 24, 1991, Michael and his parents were at Blanchard Park Elementary School, where his mother, Crystal, was participating in her women's flag football practice. While his father, Bruce, was watching the practice, four-year-old Michael was playing at a nearby playground. Unfortunately, when Bruce went to fetch Michael from the playground, he was nowhere to be found. Bruce immediately raised the alarm, and multiple volunteers began searching for him. Once the police were involved, they began investigating known sex offenders and interviewed possible witnesses in the area. They eventually found a 10-year-old girl who reported seeing a man in his late 40s or early 50s with a brown van near the playground. The police even staged a reenactment using a brown van, but it never produced any leads. Eighteen months earlier, on September 26, 1989, there was an attempted abduction of a three-year-old boy near the intersection of Kings Road and Dowler Place in Victoria. A man in a brown van was seen trying to lure a child into the vehicle using McDonald's toys. A woman named Bev Morrison saw what was happening and intervened, leading to a verbal altercation between her and the driver of the van. She called the police, but by the time an officer arrived, the driver was long gone. The witness was able to obtain the man's license plate number and gave it to the police, but it's unclear if he was ever charged with anything. However, the man who owned the van has since passed away. In 2006, detectives thought they might have found Michael after receiving a tip about a young man who physically resembled him and had lived in British Columbia since 1990. Unfortunately, DNA ruled him out. In early 2009, police in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, found a missing person poster of Michael at the home of 62-year-old Vernon Seats, who had confessed to his psychiatrist that he murdered a four-year-old boy when he was only 12 years old. He said he had been kidnapped from the zoo and forced by his abductors to shoot the boy. Seats was later found dead by Milwaukee police, apparently from natural causes. However, they never found any evidence to back up his stories or link him to Michael's disappearance. Over the years, multiple men came forward and claimed to be Michael, but DNA ruled them all out. In 2020, a TikToker named Changer Danger thought he found the rare Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle shirt Michael was said to be wearing at the time of his disappearance. However, after Michael's family reached out to the TikToker, they saw the shirt and realized it was not the same shirt he was wearing the day he vanished. In 2021, a woman named Norma, now in her 80s, came forward and said she recalled that while driving down Wark Street heading to work, she came across a young boy who was running across the park with a woman behind him. She said as the boy was running across the street, the woman dove at him, grabbed him by the legs, and pulled him down. The young woman then got up, grabbed the little guy by the arm, and marched him across in front of the witness on Wark Street. They then started to walk down King Street as a brown van was parked in a back alley. A man stood outside, holding his driver's door open, looking at the situation. The side door was flung open, and a brown blanket was hanging out of the van. It wasn't until after learning of the boy's disappearance that she suspected what she witnessed was possibly his abduction. Norma was then hypnotized in an attempt to draw out details of the van and the license plate number. However, since this is an ongoing investigation, the results have not been released to the public.
Since Michael's disappearance, his mother, Crystal, has become an advocate for missing children in British Columbia and has served as the president of Child Find British Columbia. In 2002, she lent her voice to support the Royal Canadian Mounted Police's efforts to introduce an Amber Alert system. She believes if the system was in place in 1991, Michael would have already been found. Since then, the system has been implemented. If Michael were alive today, he would be 36 years old, but sadly, he has never been found, and this case remains unsolved. On August 28, 2005, a biker pulled over at a rest stop in Aramosa Township, Ontario, and discovered something horrifying. Dumped in the brush behind the rest stop were the decomposed remains of a female. She had been covered with a Woods brand sleeping bag that was typically sold at Canadian Tire. The victim was fully dressed in clothing that investigators determined was likely purchased six hours away in Montreal, Quebec. This meant she was likely not from the area she was found in, which would also explain why locals were unable to identify her. No jewelry, personal items, or shoes were found with her. This led investigators to believe she was killed elsewhere before being dumped at the rest stop. Unfortunately, her cause of death could not be determined due to the condition of her remains. Since they were unable to identify her, she became known as Rockwood Jane Doe. She was estimated to be between 25 and 45 years old with medium brown hair, but it had been dyed and possibly appeared red or burgundy. Her nose had been broken at some point in her life and had healed improperly. Her left cheek was broken, her left eye socket was damaged, and she was missing two of her upper front teeth. She also had a previous injury to the seventh rib on the front left portion of her rib cage and fully developed arthritis in the spine from her neck to her back, which was determined to be the result of trauma, possibly from an old car accident. In 2018, there was a potential development in the case when a possible connection was made between the deaths of two boaters the same month the Jane Doe was discovered. The two men were reported missing on the same day, August 25, 2005. They had died in separate drowning incidents and their bodies had been found a week apart on August 30th and September 3rd. The deaths were written off as accidental, but the cases were reopened in 2018, around the same time the police tried to bring attention to the Rockwood Jane Doe case. The exact connection between the victims has not been made public. Investigators were at least able to get the Jane Doe's fingerprints, dental imprint, and a sample of her DNA. At one point, it was thought that the remains belonged to Elaine Dumba, who went missing from Vancouver in 1989, but that theory was eventually ruled out. Eventually, it was determined that she died shortly after the Hillside Music Festival in Gulp. The victim was found on August 28th, and the festival had wrapped up on the 24th of July, about a month before she was discovered. With this, a new theory emerged. They now believe she may have traveled to the area to attend the festival and met with foul play. However, with so many people from other regions gathering in the Gulf and Rockwood area at the time of her death, it's possible her killer was not a local. Since there was a lot of drug use at the festival, it's possible the victim wasn't murdered but overdosed instead. Unfortunately, due to the condition of the remains, they couldn't perform a toxicology test. There's also a theory that she had been physically abused due to some of her unhealed injuries. If the Jane Doe was murdered by someone close to her who had been abusing her, she might have lost contact with her family. Also, it's common for abuse victims to not seek medical care for their injuries, which could explain the lack of healing to some of her facial injuries. Some believe she might be Anne Marie LaForest, who went missing while living a transient lifestyle. She last spoke to her family in 2004 and would have been 45 years old at the time. However, since her family went long periods of time without talking to her, they didn't report her missing until 2019. Interestingly, her height, weight, and lifestyle all match the Jane Doe. However, as of 2023, the Rockwood Jane Doe remains unidentified and this case remains unsolved. 